Happy Sunday. Can we all rise as we're able? Would you pray with me? Father God, even on this beautiful Sunday, we come to you with troubled hearts, whether it's in our individual lives or in our local communities and relationships, or just paying attention to worldwide news, Lord. There is much to be troubled by if we are paying attention. But help us to remember, Lord, that you have overcome all of these things, that only love can drive out hate. Help us to release whatever burdens and bitterness that plague us, Lord, because you said that as we forgive, you forgive. So we need to have those hearts of forgiveness so that your kingdom may come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to be those instruments of your peace, Lord, that we may provide generational blessings, not generational trauma. Whatever it is that we bring to your altar, Lord, help us to bring it freely, openly, without reservation, and to leave it here knowing that your love covers it all. In your son's name we pray, amen. Something more. I search the stars and knock on heaven's door. The ancient grounds forgot to be revealed. Every wound we carry will be healed. My eyes on the sun, Lord, your will be done. the glory forever and ever finish my story we're singing freedom our testimony we sing it forever amen we'll be singing forever and ever amen beautiful each color
wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. Oh, I'm not here 
this holy moment, Lord, this kingdom that is in this present moment. 
we thank you for letting us be able to just leave everything here and to just receive and just want you. We don't ask for anything more than just your presence right now. Help us to be able to open up our hearts, to be ready to listen to the word. And any pain that we may have, we put it down here at your feet so that we can be healed, Lord, Father God, through the Holy Spirit that is just present right now. Let us be mindful of the word. Let us keep the praises on our lips for Father God. And Lord, we thank you for giving us all that you do, even though we are so undeserving of it, because you know that we are so much worth it to you, and we thank you for loving us the way you do. In complete gratitude, we come before you to listen and to receive today. And I thank you for all that you do in our lives. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Truly, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just supernatural, right, what God does here when we lift up our praise. I'm actually sweating because I was praising so hard. Um, so thank you, praise team. Amen. And, and it's good to, to feel that, that, that charge of, of love and emotion and excitement in God's presence and we want to keep that that fire stoked every day because it's uh, it's so easy to fall into complacency um, in 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 America right because we're so surrounded by churches there there are 20 churches in our zip code alone and um, we have such easy access to church to God the Bible that it's easy to take it for granted and to be complacent, but complacency, I believe, is the number one danger for our faith as American Christians. It's not hostility, it's not persecution, it's not the, you know, that the laws are somehow going to make Christianity illegal. Those are not really dangers for us. The real danger for a Christian living in America, in this seat of power and wealth and opportunity and availability, really is complacency. And complacency kills. We might think complacency is just this very um, innocuous type of condition, but complacency is deadly. Complacency can kill faith uh, just as, just as um, effectively as persecution, probably more effectively than persecution, because it's this, it's this slow, undetectable type of condition. I just learned about this disease called chronic wasting disease that some like deer in North America have. It's related to mad cow disease, but, but it's these like, it's these pro, uh, prions, these proton, proton uh, not proton, proteins that become misformed. And when these misformed proteins come into contact with other protein, healthy proteins, those healthy proteins become misformed as well. And so it's this slow degenerative disease. But what's interesting is that for 18 to 24 months, for half a year to two years, it's undetectable. These deer that have it, they don't know they have it. They don't even feel anything wrong with, with their bodies. But then after that year and a half to two years, you, you begin to see the signs. And uh, the main symptom of chronic wasting disease is weight loss. And so these deer begin wasting away, shrinking. And, and, and other symptoms are they become less social. They, they become withdrawn into themselves. They lose a sense of alertness about danger. They become un, unalert about people. So they put themselves in harm's way. And so slowly but surely, they waste away and die. And I feel like that's kind of like the danger for our faith as American Christians is that 
our faith can slowly waste away and die due to complacency. And the great challenge for the American Christian, surrounded by all these opportunities for entertainment and ambition and wealth, is to keep our first love, our love for Christ, our passion for Jesus, hot and alive. Jesus tells this parable warning against complacency in Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And it's this parable about a wedding banquet. And this is a recurring theme in, in uh, Jesus' teaching and in the Bible is this idea that the future glory, the future paradise, the future salvation is like this wedding banquet, like a party, like a feast. It says in Matthew 22, Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the word of God for the people of God. This is a really harsh and dire warning that Jesus um, gives to the people, that, the crowds that are listening to him. It's a He's, he's talking to a, a variety of people. There are religious leaders there. There are your everyday, ordinary Jewish people. There are his disciples there. There are people who don't believe. There are people who do believe. And he's telling all of them this parable because I think everybody, he's trying to hit everybody. He's trying to hit those religious leaders that are outwardly hostile to him. And those are the obvious, you know, his, the obvious enemies of God, people who are just hypocritical, who are, um, using religion for self, uh, selfish gain, for wealth. But he also hits people that are just going about their day, going about their business, who are just too busy to care about the things of God. People who are uh, busy with their business, their livestock, um, their life with their family, and, and they're just so preoccupied with life in this world. They just, they just tune God out. But then he also hits um, the riffraff, just everybody else. Because the amazing thing about this king is he's extremely generous, right? He just wants everybody to enjoy the banquet that he's prepared. And so at the end, what you have is his wedding hall is filled with people who were not invited at first, but who became invited. And so he's talking to people um, Commentators think this could be talking about Gentiles, people that were not Jewish, but people like, you know, myself, born in Korea, raised in America, have no connection to Judaism, would have been completely left out of the old covenant of salvation, but who have been invited in in the last days. And unexpectedly find ourselves at this party in this place of grace, in this place of 
celebration and glory and feasting and joy. And then there's one of those people as well who came to the party but was not dressed for the party. Um, I, there was this one time that my pastor in Hawaii, I grew up in Hawaii, he treated a few of the volunteer leaders in the church to an all-you-can-eat sushi buffet. And now, as a young man in my early 20s, this was the pinnacle of any kind of culinary experience, sushi buffet. And so me and like three other guys, the pastor took us in his car, we drove to the sushi buffet, we were so excited. Um, I was determined to eat my weight in sushi, and I was ready to go. And when we get to the, to the uh, reception, the, the person, the worker there, turns us away. Because one of the guys in our group was wearing flip-flops. It's Hawaii, it's Hawaii right? <laughs> we were like, what are you talking about? This is Hawaii. It was actually a miracle that the other three guys were not wearing flip-flops. Because <laughs> we were just constantly in flip-flops. But this one guy was wearing flip-flops to dinner at the sushi buffet. And I guess the sushi buffet restaurant thought of themselves as very special because they had the nerve to deny a flip-flop wear in Hawaii to dinner. So we had to drive back to the guy's house and pick up some shoes. And we drove back to the sushi buffet. And the five of us just were determined to eat this restaurant out of business. <laughs> But no matter how much we ate, they just kept making more. So we failed. But we had a lot of sushi. That was a great, a great dinner, a great party, a great night. But, but it just goes to show that sometimes you got to dress up. Amen? Amen? There's some occasions you do have to dress a little nicely for. And that's this idea of battling against complacency. Because as Christians, we can kind of have this very lackadaisical attitude about Jesus, that, you know, we just show up and, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, and, and as long as I believe in Jesus, I can just live however I want and be very casual and lackadaisical about it. But that man at the end of the party, that warning is for us. Gentile Christians, people who were not included in the first round of invitations, but who got, who got in by grace at the end and who've been invited into this incredible experience of God's love, forgiveness, joy, peace, healing. And it's important that we, that we come with a sense of honoring that and, and battle against complacency. I just wanna give us three, um, three tips to battle against complacency. The first is to remember where you came from. Sometimes, like, I get so used to the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, uh, the love of God, that I forget that there was a time in my life where I was completely foreign to all of those things, where I was very much living my life my way, doing all kinds of things I shouldn't have been doing, and not feeling sorry about it, um, hurting people, hurting myself, and... And, and I remember there was a time when I had no clue about the love of God. And so one of the things that, that helped me to keep my heart fresh and grateful toward God is to remember where I came from, to remember the state I was in. I still remember the day that I was saved, the day that I realized that God loved me. And, and I remember how before I experienced that, I was in a place of, of deep darkness and, and depression and despair. But that day that God gave me this vision of Jesus and Jesus was demonstrating to me that he died for me, that he understood me, that he was with me, that changed my life. For the first time in my life, I experienced God's love rather than his wrath. I, I, I felt God's favor and blessing rather than judgment and condemnation. I felt acceptance and being understood rather than um, 
just guilt, guilt over my sin. So it's helpful every once in a while because some of us can get so comfortable with the grace of God, we think somehow that we earned our place there, that we deserve it, that we have the sense of entitlement sometimes about the grace of God. But it's good to remember where we were, that there was a time, and maybe it's not the same for all of you, but maybe there was a time in your life where you were at rock bottom, where you were in despair, where you were so burdened by guilt and shame, you didn't want to show your face. And then God set you free. God met you in that place. And that's grace. You didn't earn that. You didn't make that happen. God found me when, when I was barely looking for him, when I barely believed in him. That wasn't me. That was God. So remember where you came from. And second, remember where you're going. Remember where you're going. A couple weeks ago, my family took a road trip up to San Francisco to do some school visits uh, for my son. And uh, I'm a big fan of road trips. I love those um, roadside attractions, those kitschy, dumb things. They have all these billboards. Um, and, um, and, you know, I've seen many around the nation, like in South Dakota and, and other places where there's really nothing, so they have to do something weird to get you to stop. I've been to Wall Drug. I've been to Corn Palace, uh, a place that's all corn. The outside is covered with corn, and the inside is a museum about corn. And so I've been to Corn Palace, but, but on our way to San Francisco, there's this little place before you get to Fresno called Bravo Farms. Anybody been to Bravo Farms? Yeah, all right, one person. Um, it, you wouldn't see it on the side of the road. It's kind of, you have to go in. Um, we, were, we stopped for McDonald's, and then we saw this sign to Bravo Farms, decided to eat there. But it's this amazing little um, fake western town. It's all wood. It's, it's like you would almost imagine pulling up your horse and getting a pint at a saloon or something. It's, a, it's an amazing little western town, and I loved it. I was going crazy. I loved it better than all my kids. Um, they had this little like animatronic show thing, like a Chuck E. Cheese. I was all about that. And uh, they had an ice cream shop and barbecue. And, and uh, you know, it, it's not like three Michelin star place, but it's decent for what it is. It's a roadside attraction. But as much fun as I had at Bravo Farms in Kettleman City, California, on the five freeway, before you get to Fresno. I'm plugging it because you all should just check it out. Next, next time you need a clean bathroom on your way to San Francisco, Bravo Farms. Um, but, but that wasn't my destination, right? We didn't drive on the five to get to Bravo Farms. I don't think anybody should go out of their way to go to Bravo Farms. It's just, you're just passing through. And that's what life in this world is. Life in this world is Bravo Farms. It's fun, it's interesting, but it's not our final destination. And we have to constantly remember that there is a reality and a world that takes every good and noble and beautiful thing about life in this world, magnifies it by a million, and removes all the pain and all the shame, and all the sin, and all the violence, and all the hatred, and all the anger, and all the disappointment, that there is a state of existence that we are headed toward that's like a wedding banquet, that is just joy, a joyful celebration of God and one another. That's where we're going. And I have to remind myself of that, or else I can get caught up in putting all my eggs in the basket of this life and doing everything just to make it in this life, in this world. And so that leads us to the, the third thing, is that live on earth like you belong in heaven. Live on earth like you belong in heaven. 
the, the people that were on the street that God, that God brought in in the parable, they didn't, they didn't belong there at first, but they came to belong there because of the grace of the king. And so the wedding guests, they, they belong there, but they, they had to do some, some work, right? They had to do some work to, to honor the occasion. I hate, I hate being underdressed for things, like my friend in flip-flops. There's, there are a few things more mortifying than getting to a place and, uh, and being turned away. That's, this has happened to me at, at a country club where I was wearing jeans, and I had no idea that they had a no jeans allowed policy. Um, it can happen at all kinds of places, but the thing is we want to be dressed on the outside the way the reality that is on the inside. So live on earth like you belong in heaven. Don't live like how the world lives. Live with the culture of the kingdom. Sometimes it feels like we're faking it, but it's not fake because you, you do have an invitation through Jesus Christ. We didn't sneak in. We didn't break in. We've been invited in. Live on earth like you belong in heaven. Don't let complacency kill your faith. Live with love. Live with joy. Live with peace. I know the world looks completely different, right? Right now we're... There's war. There's war between Israelis and Palestinians. There's racism still in our nation. There's, there's corruption in leadership, in government, in business. There's, there's all kinds of things in the world that are not of the kingdom. And, and it's so easy to be complacent and, and live like the world. But if we do that, if we just live like the world, if, if we live, that's what the clothing represents, our deeds, our lives. If we just live like the world, the worst thing that could happen is that we have this slow death of our faith due to complacency. And we find ourselves over the years after pursuing the things of this world that, where's my faith? What happened to my faith? What happened to my love for Jesus? And at the worst, it can come to a place where you no longer have faith at all in Christ. I don't want any of you to be like my friend wearing flip-flops to a sushi place. I don't want any of you to, to come to the end of your life and realize that though you were invited, you didn't honor that invitation and you didn't live your life honoring that invitation. I don't want any of you to get to the end of your life and realize that you're not dressed for the party because it is going to be the party to end all parties. And I don't want, I don't want you to miss out. I don't want you to be turned away. Jesus says about certain people who say, you know, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do all these things in your name? And Jesus says, you know, away from me, I never knew you. Don't get to the end of your life, however long you have, and realize that you don't have faith. Live now on earth like you're going somewhere. You might look weird. It's weird to see somebody dressed in a tux on the street, right? I love wearing tuxedos. I, you know, it, it hides all my, my belly. You wear the cummerbund, you wear a vest, it hides your belly, makes your shoulders look good. The pants lean you out. You know, when I, when I wear a tux, I look good, my friends, I look good. I love wearing a tux. It's weird seeing somebody wear a tux, but then they get to the party and they belong there. That's how it is for us as Christians. Sometimes it looks weird. Why are, you, why are you so forgiving? Why are you so patient? Why are you so generous? Why are you so loving? Why, why don't you care about this or that thing that I care about? Well, I'm headed to a wedding. I'm headed to the wedding of the millennium. I don't belong here. 
I'm not one of the riffraff. I came from the streets, but I don't belong on the streets because I've got an invitation to the wedding. And so I'm going to be dressed. You can be sure I'm going to be dressed. I should have wore a tux, but I'm, I'm going to be dressed. It's not, it's not about clothes. It's not about clothes. It's about your life, how you live. I'm going to be dressed for the party. So, so let's uh, live on earth like we belong in heaven. Let's remember where we came from. Let's remember where we're going. And let's be ready. Let's pray. Father God, we, uh, we need a reminder all the time that this life is not all there is, that this world is not the world we were made for. And, and Lord, that you call us to live with a kingdom culture here in this world, that you call us to be a counterpoint to the anger and hatred of this world by, by stubbornly insisting on love, forgiveness, truth, grace, patience, generosity, selflessness, sacrifice, and service. You, you call us to stubbornly demonstrate the culture of the kingdom, the culture of Jesus Christ in a world that is, is apathetic, in a world that is hostile, in a world that is complacent about you and your kingdom. It takes courage, it takes discipline, it takes energy, so we ask for those things in each of us today, that you would reignite our passion our, our fire, our love for Jesus. Help us to remember our first love, that first love that we found where we realized we were truly unconditionally loved. Help us to, to remember that, to stoke that. Give us a vision of heaven that's not just clouds and winged angels. Give us a vision of heaven that takes the best of what we know on earth and magnifies it by a million. Give us a vision of heaven that puts hope in our hearts when we go through this world and we read the news and watch the news and see the despair and the violence and the death and the killing that's all around us. Give us a vision of a better world where you reign, your kingdom come, your will be done. And as we have that hope in our hearts, yeah, help us to live every day for you and for your son, Jesus. And we look forward one day being reunited with you in a new heaven and a new earth. But I pray for all of us here. I pray for our city. I pray for our world. I don't want a single person to miss out on the party. So give us love for the world as well. Help us to have this burning desire to share with people the truth about the love of God, the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ, and to call people to faith. Give us that sense of urgency because we know that the times every day could be the day when you return. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. something more search the stars to knock on heaven's door creation groans for God to be revealed every wound we carry will be healed my eyes on the sun Lord your will be done thine is the kingdom power the glory Oh,
Amen. Thank you, God. We do, we do want to pray for one another and hear each other's praise and uh, any prayer concerns that we might have. So uh, we're going to do it both two ways.